Thank you for the kind introduction. And <clears throat> after all that happened yesterday, thank you for most of you for coming back again today for more. Uh, so my topic, yesterday I talked about uh, the case for nutritional ketosis, and I touched briefly on topic of, of the topic of inflammation and how that was influenced by nutritional ketosis, and I want to delve into that a bit more today, but there's a fair amount of crossover between the two talks, so for those of you who are new here, I'm going to pop through some things quickly that I presented yesterday, and uh, so I don't want to belabor too much of the interaction between the two, but they are closely related. And what I want to do is get to uh, some evidence that this is not a, um, a uh, topic that is academic. This is a topic that actually has direct clinical applications. So my conflicts of interest are shown here. I will point out that as I mentioned yesterday, I'm heavily conflicted around topics of Verta Health because I'm a founder of this um, uh, uh, basically remote continuous care way, or way of delivering uh, low carbohydrate nutrition support in, in the interest of reversing disease. Almost all the data I'll prevent or present on that topic, and there will be a few slides on that, is published in the medical literature, but uh, in, in peer review. So uh, I think it's safe and appropriate to present those to you. Uh, the, the topic of highly processed food has begun to get uh, a lot of attention, and we see it more and more when we look at comparing two diets that look similar but have very different results, as the previous speaker has mentioned. Uh, and with apologies to Gary Taubes, I'm presenting here a, uh, a one slide from a recently published study that included, it was, uh, the lead author was Kevin Hall at the NIH, uh, and they did a study where they compared two diets of some very close composition in terms of macronutrients, but one of them was made up mostly of highly processed foods, and the other was made up of highly unprocessed foods. And what this demonstrates is that over just a 14-day period of time, uh, the, uh, the caloric intake of the individuals on the highly processed food diet was much higher than on the uh, unprocessed diet. And the unprocessed diet subjects over 14 days lost about a kilogram of weight, where those on the highly processed diet uh, gained uh, close to a kilogram of weight. And this is just a 14-day interval. <clears throat> and uh, one has to be very careful with short-term studies like this because uh, people will adapt to changes in their diet slowly, not instantly. But what this implies is a diet that's highly processed it is also high, it, the reason it's highly processed is to make it highly palatable, so people will inherently eat more calories and potentially gain more weight. Uh, what's not uh, included in here is the fact that when you pro highly, when foods are highly processed, you lose nutrients, and uh, two of the most mundane nutrients uh, that I get to teach about as a nutritionist are potassium and magnesium. Uh, and both of them vary tremendously in terms of the content in similar looking foods depending on processing. And a deficiency of one or both of those can have very significant impacts among, on many processes, including cardiovascular outcomes. Uh, and yet, you, you, know, you can't make a whole lot of money selling potassium or magnesium supplements, so there really is very little attention to this because there's very little industry support for that, that topic. Um, but if uh, one wants to go back in, in relatively recent history, uh, back in the 1970s and 1980s, a very courageous person named Professor John Yudkin, Yudkin in uh, the UK um, was doing research on, on uh, uh, the most highly processed food, which is sugar, in the diet, and became convinced from very solid scientific evidence that uh, a high sugar intake was correlated with increased cardiovascular risk. Um, but that was the phase when the whole idea, to, uh, in, starting with Ansel Keys' Seven Countries study, which was published in 1970, uh, that saturated fat was the villain that he not only got kind of shouted down, he was driven out of academia uh, by uh, the hostile forces of, of uh, uh, low fat, low saturated fat uh, over the concept of, of, of sugar. But this graph on the right-hand side here is very interesting because it's basically uh, a 
carbohydrate tolerance test where they gave people a, a bolus of either um, uh, sucrose, which is uh, table sugar, glucose, pure glucose, or fructose. And what they measured here was a, a change in a biomarker of inflammation called C-reactive protein. And what this showed is that fructose and, and I'm sorry, glucose and sucrose were relatively benign, but fructose uh, had a very prompt and very significant um, uh, increase in C-reactive protein. And, and it's, this is very unusual to have a single dose of a nutrient that dramatically affects a biomarker of inflammation in such a short period of time. Uh, and then I want to move to probably one of the most controversial, if not the most controversial, nutrition study that, uh, published in the last 30 years. And this was uh, uh, public, uh, one of two publications, actually many publications, from the Lyon Diet Heart Study done in France, uh, in which uh, 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 Dr. Delogerel and colleagues uh, selected almost 600 patients, who, uh, French people, who already had one heart attack. So they were at high risk of a second heart attack. And they randomized them to two diets. One of them was a so-called prudent diet, uh, uh, recommended at the time by the American Heart Association for people to prevent uh, heart attacks. And the other was a Mediterranean diet that was rich in fruit, vegetables, fish, and olive oil. And by the way, <clears throat> there is no strict definition of a Mediterranean diet. This is one of the things where you ask four experts, you get five opinions as to what it, what's composed of. Uh, but this, this one, they, they carefully documented what they were recommending to people. And the primary fat that they advocated was olive oil. But I will, because people will stand up in the audience and say, but they gave them margarine made with canola oil. But there was a, a, a small amount of, of solid, you know, solidified uh, canola oil as margarine, uh, and they did not use butter, uh, which we can criticize them for that. But the fascinating result of this study is that within, and they planned to do a five-year study, so uh, the plan was to do this across a five-year study, but they tracked the people, and what they noticed from within the first year, there was a trend in reduction in coronary risk in the patients eating the Mediterranean diet as opposed to the prudent diet. And by the time they got out past two years, it was obviously and significantly different, and so they stopped the study. But they still tracked people, even though they'd, they told them, go back to whatever you want to eat, uh, and there was a very uh, dramatic difference in coronary risk. And you say, wow, that's great. But the reason why this is so controversial is they could not find no difference in total cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, LDL triglycerides. All of the usual suspects in terms of cardiovascular risk did not appear to differ significantly between the two groups. The only thing that, uh, that differed significantly was that the group eating the Mediterranean diet had a lower white blood cell count. Now, white blood cells are in our bloodstream ostensibly to protect us from infection, to help us deal with acute wounds and injury. So it goes up when we're injured and comes down when the injury or the challenge goes away. But here there's a difference between the two diets and white blood cell count. And this is uh, um, a, a relatively early indicator of the importance of inflammation as an underlying cause of, of heart disease. That wasn't a novel observation, however, because this was published uh, first in, uh, this paper was published in, um, uh, I believe, 1994, and, and this was the preliminary results, and then they had a very exhaustive review of all the other variables in 1999. But prior to that, I'm sorry, let, let me talk a bit about markers of inflammation. So, probably the oldest one going in, in the current era, era is total white blood cell count. Um, and that we've known about white blood cell count varying from one person to another uh, since the microscope was invented. But recently, we've come up with a whole bunch of different compounds uh, that are part of our uh, inflammatory and immune response. And there's a whole list of these things. I call it alphabet soup, if you will. And so these, these uh, the uh, adhesion uh, soluble mediators here, adhesion molecules. There are things called adipokines, acute phase proteins, including C-reactive protein, um, et cetera. Uh, and uh, every one of these has its own advocate, but none of these has been identified as the the uh, um, you know premier biomarker, the, the one thing we could trust. Um, uh, and so there's a lot of controversy as what actually is the best uh, 
single marker or combination of markers to assess the uh, inf inf inflammatory or immune response and its response to drugs or, or diet. Uh, and at this point, I would advocate that the best analysis is a broad spectrum group of these things rather than picking any one single one. Um, now, the reason why this is important is, uh, as I mentioned yesterday, biomarkers of inflammation have now been implicated in um, as predictors of, of uh, incident type 2 diabetes. That is, before somebody has diabetes, their biomarkers of inflammation are up, and then they subsequently develop diabetes in a fairly predictable way. This was controversial 10 years ago, but now it, in the last two or three years, it's become a mainstream concept. Um, uh, but what we're still trying to figure out is how does this actually work in the pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes? But as I implied, even before the uh, Leon Diet Heart Study was published in 1994, there was evidence from a number of, of well-done studies that uh, total white blood cell count predicts coronary risk. The top one here is uh, from a study of, of 4,800 people followed for three to five years, uh, published in 1991. And when you look at the top quintile, that is the top 20% in white blood cell count versus the bottom quintile, so it's 20% down here, 20% up here. You ignore the 60% in the middle. Uh, the difference in here is between the top quintile and the, and the bottom quintile is a threefold difference in coronary risk. That's a 300% difference. And by the way, these top and bottom quintile are values that are in what we still consider the, quote, normal range. So where do you find a threefold difference in, in incidence of, of, uh, uh, of potentially fatal disease uh, in the, what's considered normal range? And we have to reconsider what is normal range in this case. And the second study at the bottom was uh, done as, as part of the Framing, Framingham uh, prospective uh, diet and lifestyle uh, study of uh, the causes of heart disease. Uh, and there they followed... Uh, uh, both men and women for uh, 14, I'm sorry, for 12 years, and what they found was that for the uh, non-smoking men with a white cell count under 6, 6, 6 6.0, which is near the, it's a, the, really at the bottom quintile, versus anything above 6.0, so that is the other 80%, there's a 2.1 times greater risk of heart disease. So this is a very robust predictor of heart disease, and that's great, except we still don't know why. Um, and so that's, you know, so your, your doctor, maybe for some of you, your physician will measure your CRP, but in most cases, because we don't have a drug that safely lowers CRP, um, you know, it's not something that's routinely included in medical practice. Um, and again, I showed you the data for white blood cell count. This is data for interleukin-6, which is a very modest predictor. But the reason why CRP is getting a lot of attention is if you look at the, the bottom quartile here divided in quarters, and the bottom two quartiles versus the top two quartiles of CRP, you can see a, as much as a fourfold difference uh, in relative risk of, of uh, subsequent coronary vascular disease. Um, so again, this is... A, appears to be a robust biomarker, uh, and uh, therefore it's receiving a lot of attention. <clears throat> now, I mentioned that there is no drug that safely reduces CRP, and somebody would raise their hand and say, yeah, but statins reduce CRP, and that is true. Uh, the modern statins, uh, including this one called rosuvastatin, um, will, in people who have relatively high CRP values, reduce it by 20 to 30 percent, uh, typically. And to assess the, 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 if lowering CRP with a drug will reduce heart attack risk, um, one, of the, one of the major proponents of CRP as a biomarker, Dr. Paul Ritker at Harvard, designed this study. And this is a massive study that recruited 17,000 people uh, who never had a heart attack. So this would be a primary prevention study, whereas the Leon Diet Heart Study was a secondary prevention study. It takes a lot to, you have to treat a lot more people who haven't had coronary disease to prevent a, an event than if you do a secondary prevention study. So a very massive study. They recruited people with relatively low LDL cholesterols, under 130, and people with relatively high CRPs, above 2.0. Um, and they treated them with either the drug or placebo, so it was a two-arm randomized controlled trial. 
and the, the primary endpoint was the first major cardiovascular event. Uh, and they halted the study after 1.9 years when they found a relative risk for the people on the statin group of 0.556, and that was highly statistically significant. But since in this primary prevention population, coronary events are rare, they only prevented a small number of coronary events. But, they got, but it was a significant result, and they stopped the study, and they said, see, um, lowering CRP is, is useful. The problem is that in addition to, although the LDL cholesterol was relatively low in this population, and they were selected for that trait, they dropped LDL by about 50%. And so the, the LDL protagonists, the people who say LDL is the most important, say, look, you went from low to even lower, and that pre prevented the heart attacks. It wasn't the, the CRP. So this is, you, you can't attribute causality for the study. Um, uh, but again, it, it appeared that, that even with people, people with high CRPs and moderate LDLs, giving them a statin was beneficial to their health. That was published in 2008. Uh, in 2012, it, four years later, they published a, 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 a follow-up study from the same study saying, oh, by the way, there was a 28% increase in the incidence of type 2 diabetes in the people who got the statin. Um, which essentially wipes out most of the, the benefit. Um, and you would have to wonder, why did they wait four years? And if you're a conspiracy theorist, you would say, oh, they held it back. I, as somebody who spent quite a bit of my career trying to convince editors to publish you know, provocative results, it may be that they, they, they took four years because they couldn't get it published because the editors said, oh, we, you know, there's something wrong with this study if, if, a, if a healthy drug like a statin is actually causing diabetes. Um, we haven't resolved that question, um, but I would point that out. So Ridker was kind of frustrated by that, so he said, well, what, if, what else can I do to lower CRP? And it turns out there's a modern class of drugs called monoclonal antibodies, and one of them called canakinumab is a monoclonal antibody that when you inject it into people, it uh, reduces blood levels of one of the in inflammation mediators called IL-1 beta. And IL-1 beta produced in the periphery, when it circulates through the blood and goes to the liver, it prevents the liver or reduces the liver's production of CRP. So it's basically indirectly an anti-CRP drug. And so they gave this canakinumab drug to people for four years versus placebo. So people are either injecting the real stuff or injecting placebo. And they monitored them for four years. And at the end of four years, they found was that, that the relative risk of, of coronary disease getting the uh, for the people getting the canakinumab, um, uh, the relative risk was in the point um, uh, 93 to point 80. So a, a very modest reduction in coronary risk, but it was statistically significant. Uh, and at the same time, CRP was reduced in the 25 to 30 to 40 percent range, similar to the amount of reduction in CRP that you get with with a relatively high dose statin. Uh, and so this is clear evidence that reducing inflammation can have a very modest effect on coronary risk. But then at the, at the bottom of the results section, they said, oh, by the way, uh, using canakinumab was associated with an increase in fatal sepsis, that is, infection. And so what's happening here is because these are not biomarkers of inflammation, these are mediators of inflammation, and inflammation is a critical component of our defense against infection, our ability to heal wounds, uh, and defend ourselves from, from, from uh, internal damage and external attack, that when you unilaterally bring down, markedly bring down one of these, these bioactive compounds, you may expose the body to to significant risk. And so actually there was no reduction in, in total mortality in this study. Uh, so it was an academic tour de force but had no clinical relevance. And besides the fact that canakinumab is a frightfully expensive drug, at least when, when purchased in the United States. How about nutrients? And we've all heard of anti-inflammatory nutrients and uh, probably the one most touted anti-inflammatory nutrient in the last uh, 40 years or so is fish oil, the omega-3 fats. Uh, uh, either a, as from fish or a uh, fermentation product, pure fermentation product uh, of the same class called DHA. There are other fatty acids such as uh, gamma linolenic acid, which has anti-inflammatory properties. Somebody's trying to drown me out here. 
Then there's this compound found in red wine called res resveratrol, um, and it's a polyphenol compound, and I like to point out, yeah, but of the polyphenols in red wine, only 2% typically is resveratrol, and there are a whole bunch of others. So people who are selling you purified resveratrol are selling you a very minor component of what might be beneficial in red wine. Uh, be careful of isolated nutrients, because these are highly refined nutrients. When you have a single nutrient, and you say, oh, take this single nutrient and it'll be potent, realize that that's a highly refined product. It's not naturally occurring in food. Uh, there are some uh, compounds that do have potent anti-inflammatory effects. You know, we were in our dis debate yesterday, the topic of vitamin E was brought up and the fact that vitamin E appears to be uh, very ineffective in reducing coronary risk in, in many studies where, where it's been utilized. But the vitamin E that everybody talks about is alpha tocopherol. It's, but when you look in real food, the uh, vitamin E is a minor component of the tocopherols because there are many of them found in foods. Uh, and gamma tocopherol, which is the most common version of tocopherol found in foods, is a potent anti-inflammatory agent. And again, I have no financial interest in this, but I actually have, there are two issued patents with my name on them using gamma tocopherol, the lower CRP, and it's a very potent reducer of CRP. And you've never heard of that because the, the startup company in which we did that work went bankrupt because this was not the droid we were looking for. They sold the patents to a major uh, American pharmaceutical company and they've paid the, the duties on those patents for the last 20 years. And the reason is that that company sells two products in the United States called uh, Motrin and Tylenol. And two existing, nowhere near as potent or effective anti-inflammatory agents, but they have a big market, so they're defending my, their market for this. Again, no conspiracy here, just this part of business. So yesterday I mentioned this, this concept of, of nutritional ketosis, and that there's a, you know, that's been around for, for, you know, we've understood this for decades, but the new thing here is that uh, beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is a primary ketone we make when we are in nutritional ketosis, when it circulates through the bloodstream, not only does it provide a superior energy supply for brain and heart, but it turns out that it has what I would call a hormone-like activity. That is, it's something made in the liver that circulates through the blood, then throughout the body, it alters gene expression. So it has epigenetic effects that alters how we respond um, to uh, oxidative stress and inflammation. And this, was, this revolution was kindled by uh, a group of scientists at the University of California, San Francisco, uh, led by Eric Verdon and John Newman. And what they've def uh, demonstrated is that beta-hydroxybutyrate alters how genes are expressed in the body, and some of the principal genes that they alter are genes that regulate our internal defenses against oxidative stress. Uh, and specifically, when you don't have ketones around, those defending genes are turned off. When you have ketones in your blood at a modest level, that those defense genes are turned on. Um, and this really revolutionized our perspective of beta-hydroxybutyrate, and it kind of invigorated me to look more deeply into the therapeutic benefits of nutritional ketosis. Uh, I put this up there just to say this is extremely complex. One way in which... Um, oxidative stress translates into inflammation is uh, these things called free radicals or reactive oxygen species attack polyunsaturated fats in our membranes and then turn those polyunsaturated fats into things that look like prostaglandins, but they're not. Uh, they're things called isoprostanes, but they have similar pro-inflammatory effects. Another way in which beta-hydroxybutyrate is known to alter inflammation is there is a very potent regulatory gene which has the very uh, long name of the NLRP3 inflammasome. And this is a, a, an assembly of different proteins in the nucleus that when they come together uh, and, uh, in the presence of our genes, they regulate a whole bunch of inflammatory processes in, in our body. So this is a master regulator, which has multiple downstream effects, uh, altering, oxidate, or altering inflammation. And beta-hydroxybutyrate in physiological doses blocks this assembly, so it blocks downstream inflammation. Not completely, but it modulates it in a physiologically normal way, because ketones are normal compounds of our, of our metabolism, particularly when we restrict carbohydrates. 
So that leads me to the concept on the left. If you eat a ketone-suppressing diet, it alters the body's, or it increases the body's uh, production of reactive oxygen species in mitochondria, and you get these downstream effects of membrane damage and pro-inflammatory effects. Whereas if you eat a ketogenic diet, which is actually a fairly narrow spectrum in terms of lo it's very low carbohydrate, not moderately low carbohydrate. Uh, you block the NLRP3 inflammasome and you block the productions of isoprostanes, and that's how we get these, these anti-inflammatory effects. So how much of an anti-inflammatory effect do we get with this? I mean, does this come anywhere near what we could do with a monoclonal antibody? Well, Jeff Volek and his team did this study, and they let me kind of sit in as a, a fly on the wall watching them do this. This is a study published in 2008 in which they put people with metabolic syndrome, so prediabetes, on two different diets. Uh, one group ate a relatively high carbohydrate diet um, with moderate protein and, and quite low fat. And the second group ate, got 12% carbs, 28% protein, and, and high fat. Um, the high-fat, uh, low-carb group lost more weight than the low-carb, well, the low-fat group, but they were um, uh, roughly equivalent uh, or, or, or similar in, in terms of the rate of weight loss at the end of the study. And when we measured 14 different biomarkers of inflammation, we we'll go through to this one, 14 different biomarkers of inflammation, we looked only at where the two groups differed. Both groups are losing weight, but the group that were on the ketogenic diet seven of those 14 were significantly further reduced with the ketogenic diet. So this in, in, indicates that this is an across-the-board, broad-spectrum result rather than the very focused effect that you'd get from a drug. The, do we see this in the real world? Because, again, that was a short-term study. And I uh, presented data yesterday from the uh, study that we're doing with Dr. Sarah Hallberg, the uh, diabetes reversal study, uh, 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 in Lafayette, Indiana, and this is a study of 262 people with type 2 diabetes. Their diabetes duration was more than eight years, which means they have fairly advanced disease. This is not early in the course of the disease. Uh, we treated them with remote continuous care involving uh, an expert team of coach, physician, and they had a uh, social support group online. We had daily biometric monitoring of these people, which means we could do it safely. Uh, at the end of one year, we had 83% of people still in the study. So when people say, well, you can go on a ketogenic diet, but nobody can do it long term and they'll drop out. We had very good retention in the study. The next question is, can people stay in nutritional ketosis long term? And at one year, at eight months, the group, made, out to the first eight months, they maintained a 0.5 or greater millimolar beta hydroxybutyrate level. And even at one year, they're at 0.4. If, you're eating, if you ate your, your bagel and orange juice for breakfast, you're down here at 0.1. So this is still a significant uh, level of, of type or of, of, of nutritional ketosis. Um, I won't show you the two-year data, which we just published recently. This is our one-year uh, weight loss result. And again, these are people eating to satiety. Uh, and this is what happens to the whole white blood cell count at one year. We had, it looks like a modest reduction, but there's no medication that will safely do this. And we believe this is safe based on the fact we now have three and a half year data in this, this cohort. Um, and the p-value here, I love p-values that are less than 0.001. That means one in a thousand chance that this would happen by chance. This is one times 10 to the minus 16th. I love scientific notation p-values. Uh, this is what happened to CRP. CRP oftentimes responds more slowly. So at, at three months, there was uh, no, neg or no reduction. But at one year, again, we had a highly significant reduction in CRP. Um, and we have not published the the uh, inflammation biomarker data, because we've done 16 of these, but I will tell you that we maintained the white cell count in CRPs out to two years and had effects, very good effects on multiple others as well. So what we're looking at here in terms of ketones is not just a fuel for the brain. And by the way, it's a good fuel for the heart, and it's a good fuel for the GI tract uh, uh, because it's a short-chain fatty acid. But it's now been shown to have positive effects on, in animal models on longevity, we show effects on uh, uh, reduction in, in inflammation uh, and uh, improvement in insulin, insulin sensitivity as well. So the conclusions are that nutritional ketosis 
Um, and in our case, we use a highly unrefined diet. This is all real foods that you, you buy in the store. We tell people if there are more than five ingredients on the package, don't buy it, because uh, that many ingredients means it's refined. Um, and that we have a, this has a broadly based effect on biomarkers of inflammation. And but I, we also believe that we now using uh, our remote continuous care technology can do this safely, even in people with type 2 diabetes on drugs. And with that, I thank you.